Good morning, Downtown Hope. My name is Emily Griffith. Thank you so much for joining us here in person and online this morning. Today we'll be continuing in our series called Real Talk Through Word and Prayer. If you're new here, we'd love an opportunity to connect with you. So um, if you grab one of these green connect cards on the front and back tables of the space, you can um, fill it out. On the back of the card, there's a QR code that you can scan or text hello to the number on the back of the card. Another opportunity to get connected um, is attending our Discover Downtown Hope lunch today at 1230, um, right over at Three Monticello. If you don't know where that is, you can follow me. I'll be going over there. Um, and we'd love an opportunity to connect with you, just get to know more about you um, and uh, any questions you might have about downtown hope. Now would everyone please stand and join me and the body of believers around the world in the collective reading of scripture. Please read along with me Psalm 141, 1 through 4. O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to any evil to busy myself with wicked deeds. In company with men who work iniquity and let me not eat of their delicacies. Let's sing the doxology together this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. Praise Him, all creatures. 
name is Jedediah. I'm the worship leader here at Downtown Hope. I'm excited to worship the Lord with you this morning. Let's sing together.
continue to sing together. Downtown Hope. You guys can take a seat for a minute. It's my privilege to lead us in a time of worship through our time of um, confession and assurance. I'm John. I'm I'm the Next Gen Pastor, and it's my great privilege to be with you guys today. So happy New Year again. Welcome to Downtown Hope. It's good to see everybody. It's good to worship together. So we're just going to take a moment, take a few seconds this morning, and do what the Psalms tell us to do. And search me, O God, and know my heart is my go-to every day. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any offensive way, and there's plenty in mine. See if there be any offensive way, and lead me in the way everlasting through the cross, worshiping through confession. So let's take a few moments, a few seconds, and do that personally. Examine our hearts about our thoughts and our words, and loving our neighbor as ourself, and all that goes with that. Just take a few moments in the silence of your heart. 
And hear these wonderful words of assurance. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Jesus, we thank you that we're new creations, afresh this day. And you've taken some old stuff away even now and brought some new things on. To your glory we pray. Amen. If you have young ones who'd like to dismiss them to our children's program, now would be a great time to do that. Other than that, stand up and let's continue to worship. Let's remember Jesus together. Let's not forget. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. And sin separated far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul, for the first time I had hope. Thank you. And thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. But thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. And you took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting and life has no end for I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb thank you Jesus for the blood of life thank you Jesus you have washed me white thank you Jesus you have saved
glory to his name. Amen. Let's thank God for that. You may take your seats. Uh, my name is David. I have the gift of serving deaths on Hope as lead pastor. And I want to wish everyone a happy new year. Happy new year. Uh, this is my first time back here since it feels like 2010. Uh, I, think, I think the last Sunday I was here was two, uh, December 18th. Uh, right before Christmas Eve, I caught COVID. And so I was unable to gather with the body and so fully recovered. Um, but then just uh, soon after that, just as an update, so you know what's going on with me, uh, my father had to get rushed to the hospital. And so we spent uh, just under two weeks in the hospital, but he's home now, recovering. Um, and so a lot of people have been praying. Um, and so uh, our family is trying to figure out how to best support, take care of him. And so uh, this month, I'll probably be in and out. And so the team has given me some margin and capacity to figure that out. I got some family possibly coming from Ghana that can, uh, that'll come in and help out as well. And so we're uh, sharing the load. So be praying for us. Uh, but so glad that uh, I could be here with us this morning. Uh, this is your first time here. Again, welcome to Downtown Hope. Uh, we are a family that is being transformed. We are a movement of people uh, being transformed by the gospel for the sake of our city, for the sake of this world. What that simply means is that as, as God in Christ Jesus is transforming lives, so many of us have experienced that. We want to see gospel transformation really impact. We want to see the new life of Jesus impact our friends, neighbors, the cities we live in. And so what a joy it is for us to partner together in this new year to that end. We're beginning this new year focusing on elevating the word in prayer. Uh, Joy's going to talk about prayer this morning uh, as he shares from scripture. But uh, gospel transformation is taking place amongst many people. Um, and so it's a gift for me to invite uh, John Cavallaro up. He'll give an update on students. Uh, and then uh, we'll hear from a few more folks on what's going on in our student ministry. Thanks, David. Welcome back again. Hey, good to see everybody again. So I'm John again. And, and God is working amongst our students. He's working among the students of Downtown Hope. He's working among the students of Annapolis. He's working among the students of Anne Arundel County. And I have touches all around the county. God is really on the move. And this morning, um, because of my dear friend Grace, she put together a, a little bit of a video of what God's been doing this past semester. But as you watch, I'm gonna encourage you to pray about your participation. So I have three charges for you. Pray for us. Like if you would like to pray for the student ministry and have the details of what's going on, grab me or grab Seamus and Grace and we'll tell you how to exactly pray for students by needs, by what's going on in Annapolis High School and our other schools. Secondly, your resources. Uh, we're looking for host homes. We're looking for scholarship money for camps that are coming up this summer. If you're able to do that, see me, see those guys. And then um, thirdly is uh, maybe join the leadership team, you know, grab, grab me for coffee and let's get together and you'll hear more about that in a minute. But we're gonna roll the video now. And so enjoy. <laughs> That's hot. All right. How y'all doing? Uh, so this is, my name is Seamus. This is my wife, Grace. We've been working with the youth ministry off and on for about six years now. Uh, and so with my man, Johnny here, uh, who's been a recent addition, been leading, it's been uh, nice to have a more cohesive unit going on here. Uh, so he was the, uh, the youth pastor at our high, or at uh, the church I was at when I was in high school. So this is the byproduct of his work. So if you like what you see, send your kids. If you don't, that's on him. Uh, so right now... <laughs> 
So right now, as you said, we're looking for things like host home, resources like that. So we're going to be meeting every uh, the second and fourth Fridays of every month for the uh, middle school kids. So bring your kids on out. If you have a home that you want to host in, something like that, come by let us know. We'd love to swing through. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, we're really excited to be moving back to Fridays. We're going to be uh, meeting every second and fourth Friday, like Seamus said, um, from 7 to 8 8.30 p.m. Um, middle school is a really exciting time uh, as these 11, 12, and 13-year-olds transition from childhood into early, early adulthood. Um, they grow in their autonomy, and they can start to choose Jesus for themselves. And so it's a very, like real time that as they experience the world, the heaviness of it, some of them have some incredibly difficult things going on in their lives that our hope and our prayer is that they get to know Jesus, hear the good news, and learn how to apply that to their lives. And yeah. And uh, with the high school, <clears throat> we meet every Sunday night starting <clears throat> again tonight at from 7 o'clock to 8.30 at our other building, Three Monticello, just a stone's throw. And we have campaigners for um, Annapolis High School, but but six other high schools are coming. They're all coming from the county where there's not a young life. It is so exciting. There's unity, and we're looking at Mark's gospel, and each week the Lord just kind of lays on my heart as I get the privilege of teaching. One of the questions, you know, Jesus has a couple hundred questions he's throwing at the disciples, at the crowds, and tonight's question is, what would you have me do for you? He's engaging with this, this blind guy in uh, Mark 10. We're just gonna look at that for half an hour. Implications individually and imp implications as we think about becoming more and more involved and pressing out into all the schools that we have. So just so excited for that. And then also, if you are interested in joining the leadership team, starting Monday nights, January 23rd, we actually have new leader training with our partnership with Young Life. You could see me about that. It's a very concise six-week training class, and it goes over fundamentals of student ministry and um, just how to do it whimsically with the love of Christ. So again, see us if you're interested in knowing how to pray better more and more informed see us if you're interested in joining the leadership team see us if you have resources if you'd like to go yeah i, I could i could pay for a couple of kids to go to camp we would love that Let's thank God for so i'm going to pray uh and i invite you to pray with us as we pray for our students uh these are the various ways we worship the Lord. So we worship in our gatherings. We worship in serving. Another way we worship the Lord is through giving. And so as I pray, I want to also pray for our offering. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we believe that giving is an act of worship, that God in his goodness has uh, provided all things. And so in response uh, to him, we practice something called first fruits giving. Um, so out of what God provides, we first give to him, and then we live on the rest. And so if you consider downtown Hope your home church, uh, just want to encourage you as we jump into this new year, continue this new year, um, just to express gratitude first and foremost from our team, uh, just for the support uh, this particular body has been um, in this capacity. And as we look forward into this new year, I would encourage us to continue to do so. You can give uh, either online or and there's also an offering box at the back of the space. Uh, so would you join me as I pray? Father, thank you so much uh, that you're good. Thank you that your mercies endure forever. And thank you that you hear us, and above all, Lord, thank you for Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the many ways that you uh, uh, gave evidences of your grace in 2022. And now in 2023, Lord, we look forward to seeing a mighty move from you. And so, Lord, we pray that that would be true, especially now for our students, the next gen, Lord. We pray for these meetings, for uh, the training, for those serving, and we pray especially for our youngsters, Lord. Would this year be an amazing year where they would see you? And so, Lord, we pray your blessing upon our student ministry. And we pray, Lord, that you would use the efforts of our team in ways that would even amaze us, Lord. I pray for uh, this uh, gathered body, those watching online. Lord, may your blessing be with us. And may you use us to be a blessing to all those we might meet. That the new life of Jesus that has really transformed our lives, that we would see it impact our friends our neighbors, see it impact the cities, see it impact the cities we live in. I pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, on that note, let's stand as we greet one another as we pass the peace.
All right, you can go ahead and grab a seat. Good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing? Lots of good conversation happening in the room. I love it. I was just so thankful as we're singing to Jesus here. Just what a gift it is to be part of this body, what Jesus is doing among us in our city, in our uh, everyday lives. My name is Joey. I have the gift of serving Downtown Hope as pastor of cultivation. And uh, what that means is the team has really allowed me in this season uh, to establish a ministry called Estuary, which is just a metaphor that talks about where, uh, that talks about the places that Jesus sends us. Uh, We know the movement in in the rhythm in scripture from beginning to end is about us going out into the world. And uh, just yesterday, just quick, I want to keep updating the body as we go along. We had a great uh, meeting full of leaders in Three Monticello yesterday morning, uh, leaders from Pakistan, leaders from local public housing communities, um, uh, a guy from the FBI, uh, people who are thinking about how to reach friends and neighbors. And so I want to continue to, uh, just as a team, give that invitation to you, whether it's with students, uh, I love what John and Seamus and Grace shared, or whether it's with a neighbor or a coworker. If Jesus has called you to reach, to love, to seek the flourishing of somebody's somebody in your life we would love to walk alongside of you train you equip you encourage you uh, there's a sweet cohort that's forming around prayer and we spend time together uh, just in the word and and uh, in the vision that Jesus has called us so reach out if we can serve you in that way uh, everybody on our team here at downtown hope is is available as well uh, this morning as David mentioned we're uh, continuing our series through the word and prayer in the first few weeks of the month here uh, Uh, This morning, I'm going to hit on some of the foundation of prayer and a little bit of uh, the why behind prayer and the heart behind prayer. Uh, Next week, Jacob's going to be walking us through the word, and then I'm going to give a plug for two weeks from now, a dear friend, uh, his name's Frog, uh, Frog or Ewing from uh, the UK is going to be here. He and his wife, Amy, are coming to our city to minister, and he'll be sharing more on prayer um, in two weeks. So uh, he's a wonderful communicator a uh, Anglican vicar. So um, you'll uh, get to have a little bit taste of that as well. Uh, this morning, we're going to root our time over the next few minutes in Philippians chapter 4, 6 through 7. It's a passage you may be familiar with. We're just going to take some time to walk through it together. So you can open up your Bibles. It'll also be on the screen beside me. And uh, we're going to take the next few minutes on this. I think timely uh, passage. Um, you guys ready? Okay, good. Let me read it and pray and then we'll dive in. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. We could probably just stop there, couldn't we? (laughs) Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And this is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the gift of gathering with your people. Lord, we gather here. Our brothers and sisters are gathering all over this city, all over this county, and all over our world. Lord, you are the one, Lord Jesus, that, are, that is on our hearts this morning. I pray for each person in the room here. Some of us have been walking with you and have come into the new life that you offer uh, for many years. And some of us, Lord, are just here asking questions. We're, we're not even sure uh, if all this is real. And I thank you for every person in this room, Lord, and that this is a safe space to grow, to learn, to explore. Um, and our prayer is uh, we believe that your Holy Spirit is here among us. Um, and that you would meet each of us as individuals and collectively as families, as circles of friends. And Lord, that you would surface and raise in us the things that you want us to hear. You would convict us. You would encourage us. You would illuminate the truth of your word to our hearts. And, it, and this just wouldn't be some kind of religious exercise, Lord, but, but we would really be transformed. Lord, this this would get into our bloodstream. This would get into our lives. And we would be changed because of it, for your name, for your glory, because of the vision that you have for the world, Lord, because you're establishing your kingdom in the world in in anticipation of what one day you will fully restore, Lord. We're available, we're here, we're your instruments, and we want to hear from you. We're desperate for you. 
And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Every so often, there's, there's one of these public moments that happens in culture, and it occurs and it gives us this haunting window into how desperate we are in our condition. And one of these moments, as many of you uh, may have been tracking over the last week, happened on Monday Night Football. Um, here's a picture of, uh, that you may be familiar with. You may have seen this last week. Uh, Buffalo Bills' DeMar Hamlin collapses on the field after making a tackle. Uh, he gets up for a brief moment, if you saw the video, as haunting, only to completely collapse on the field. Um, his life is barely saved on the field, but, but thank God he's now off of breathing tube, and it looks like he's going to recover. And while it's not yet clear what exactly happened to DeMar Hamblin on the field, one of the things, one of the conversations that's buzzing around the news is something called commodio cordis, which if you're familiar with this concept, it's when there's an acute blow to the chest, and when the, when the chest is not protected properly or guarded properly, the heart stops. It throws a person in cardiac arrest, and it, it's not clear if this is what happened yet, but whatever happened to DeMar on that night, last Monday night, the idea of the heart not being guarded properly and his heart stopping on the field is a pointed image of our vulnerability. And, and this is the very question that this passage raises for us this morning. Someone or something will guard our hearts. I'm not talking about the physical organ, our heart, but our inner life, as we're going to see here in, in the language that Paul uses. Someone or something will guard your heart. Whether you know it or not, whether you're intentional about it or not, the question is who? And so let's look at this passage. There's three observations we want to make. First is the guarding of our hearts. The second is there's, there's actually two kinds of guardians that emerge in this passage. And then thirdly, there's an act that, that changes the guard, as it were. So the guardian, the guardian of our hearts, two kinds of guardians, and the act that changes our hearts. So let's look first at the guarding of our hearts. If you look with me in verse, the second part of verse 7, we find the word here, guard. Okay? The language here is a military term. It's a military term that would be a guard that would prevent hostile invasion. Isn't that interesting to think about that language that Paul's using? Now, if you think about the church at Philippi, the people of Jesus there, they would understand this because it's the first century, and there are Roman soldiers all over guarding the various outposts of the Roman Empire, and Philippi was no different. Uh, there would have been um, a, a garrison of Roman soldiers sort of guarding the area. So when they're reading this word guard, they're hearing this word for the first time, they're like, ah, so the guard that we're talking about here is not just sort of like this soft kind of, oh, make sure it's okay. No, this is like military operation, the guarding, the protection of a heart. And in the second part there, we find the heart and the mind. He puts these uh, sort of two ideas together. And obviously, we're not talking about uh, a physical heart here. We're, though, though the reason the Scripture uses this idea of the heart describes the heart as the sort of the seat of the inner life, the spiritual life of, the, of, of our very nature. Uh, as the physical heart gives life without our hearts beating, without blood circulating, there's no life in us. So our, our heart, our mind, the inner life of a person— also has a life to it and has to be guarded. It's not necessarily, we say, sometimes we use the word heart and we're talking about our emotions. It's not just our emotions. It's not just our feelings. It's also what we will. Uh, it's also broader in, in, in the scripture. It also includes our minds as well. He's, he's pulling this language in here as well. It's what Paul is saying here is that the whole inner being of a person and for a person who is in Christ has to consistently be guarded. It will be guarded by something or someone. The heart cannot be a without a guardian. 
Our hearts are constantly being guarded. The question is who? And this is to our second observation. There's two guardians that we find in this passage. This is kind of the bulk of the passage here, okay? So there's two guardians. The first guardian we find is at the first part of verse 6, anxiety. Do not be anxious about anything, Paul writes. Anxiety is one of the guardians that sometimes emerges over our hearts. Is anybody with me here? The word anxiety here, to be anxious, to be troubled with cares. Now, think about the Philippian church again. Uh, Think of how the church was born. At least one of the groups within the Philippian church was a Philippian jailer who was freaking out and about to take his life because his prisoners escaped. A lot of anxiety around that moment, a lot of worry around that moment. So he would have known, say he was in that crowd listening to this letter read for the first time, he would have understood what Paul is saying when he's talking about this word anxiety, do not be anxious. But all through the letter of Philippians, if you read it, there's threats of persecution, there's hostility from neighbors happening. And so this is a group of people in this church. Church is not a building, church is a people. And among these people, these friends who are living in Philippi, who have identified with Jesus, this anxiety was a real thing. And I think that's probably not too different than maybe this room here. It's not too different than the culture we find ourselves in. Now, in this definition of anxiety, it's, it's not just worry, it's not just troubled with cares. There's a little bit of a nuance to it in the Greek, and, and, and it might be described as something like this, to seek to promote one's interests. And this is really important in understanding this definition of anxiety, okay? Uh, idiomatically, we might say it like this, don't let your thoughts kill you. Or maybe another way to say it is this, don't let your thoughts take away your strength. Because this is what anxiety does when it's the guardian of our hearts, isn't it? Is that it can sap us. And it turns us inward in such a way that all we can begin to think about and become obsessed with is either the uh, external situation that's coming in at us that we're struggling with or all the thoughts that are inside. And this can lead to what I would call, because I've experienced this myself, and maybe you have too, an absolute obsession with your own inner thoughts and thinking. And it's like, whatever you're doing in the world, whatever you're doing in the day, all you, you just keep coming back to this word. You just keep coming back to this thing. You just keep coming back to it. It keeps plaguing you. And some of us are really transparent about this, but some of us like to push this under and not be honest about it. But it's a real thing. Underneath of this, is this idea that, that is, is so subtle in our culture. It, it's, it's a product of the Enlightenment. It's this idea that my own voice, my own, and, and it translates my own ability, my own thoughts, sort of the rise of this autonomous self, is how I deal with life in the world. Do what's good for you. I can do it myself, right? It's all, I mean, everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that, we, everything that is, is coming at us in the culture is oftentimes this subtle, quiet message that you basically have to deal with life on your own. And if you can't deal with it on your own, there's something wrong with you. You're weak. And that makes for a horrible guardian of a heart, does it not? I mean, no wonder so many of us are an- so anxious. In the, the uh, TV series, The Walking Dead, which is, is just a great commentary on the human condition, at one of the beginning episodes, uh, Rick, who's the main character, is actually in a military tank. He's trying to escape zombies. And there's a zombie in the tank, and he takes a gun, and he shoots the zombie. Okay, maybe if you've seen the series, you're familiar with this moment. But he shoots the zombie in the tank, and the tank is such an echo chamber that the blast just knocks him out. And it's just, it's depicted in this really powerful way. And I think it's actually a really profound vision of the kind of story that we're encouraged to live inside of. This echo chamber where there's no escape. It's just me inside of myself with my thoughts all the time. That is incredibly horrifying. And yet it's what the culture we find ourselves elevates as the guardian of our heart. We have to guard it ourselves. No wonder it creates so much anxiety. A post-enlightenment Western vision of the world 
where we're told that reality is determined and sustained by our own individual human power is a horrifying, anxious vision, my friends. The New York Times this week ran this really interesting article. You may have seen it. Damar Hamlin and the Existential Crisis of Monday Night Football. Now, the article had a lot of things to say, but one of the things that I think was incredibly, what, what they kept saying in the article is the, 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 the hour-long process where the game wasn't quite canceled, the commentators had to kind of figure out how do we talk about what's going on here, and it was just like no one quite had words, and it was awkward, and they were kind of thankful for the commercial breaks that came along. And, and, and one of the things that was absolutely horrible about that image and about if you saw this happen on Monday night, is just on a human level, the empathy that we feel of like, oh my goodness, that's horrible. This poor man. And we all feel that in, a, in, a, in actually a, a sad, but really that's a, that's a healthy human response to when someone is suffering or someone's on their deathbed in that way. But I, I think that what, one of my observations, and that, you know, this is all just sort of Joey thinking through these things and processing and, and, and assessing these, but I think part of what is going on, what, what one of the challenges in that moment was, is that in that moment, whether we're consciously thinking of it or not, all of our self-help, all of our I can do it, all of I am my own God as a way, it unravels when we see a premier athlete collapse and there is nothing he can do to help himself. There's nothing in that moment. No one in that moment is going to say, come on, Damar, get on up. What's wrong with you? So there's this huge, like, conflict in our cultural imagination of how we're to live our lives and what's to guard our heart, ourselves, and we're to be our own protectors. And in this moment of, like, he, he can't be his own protector. He can't actually help himself out. You see, the, the problem is that we are horrific guardians of our own hearts because we're limited by being contained to our very own existence and our very own experiences. I cannot get outside of myself to see. I just can't. I just don't have that kind of vision. As much as I want to think I can see my life and see my world and I kind of sit above it, no, I'm, I'm constantly consumed from within. I don't have the ability and therefore my reality is consistently defined by what's happening in here and what's happening in here. And it becomes this echo chamber. And it can become an echo chamber of deep anxiety when we ourselves become the guardians of our hearts. I was struggling with this last week. I was feeling anxious about something. And then all of a sudden, I snapped at a friend with my tongue. And I had to go back and apologize to him. It's like, what's going on there? What's going on there is I'm living in my head and my heart. And I'm all consumed about all this other stuff. And then, whoop, you know, hurt a friend. I know none of you have ever done that before. If you're ever stressed about something, you never like lash out or hurt somebody else or have a bad attitude with someone, do you? <laughs> no, never. <laughs> and yet this passage says, yet, yet the imperative here is in, be anxious about nothing. <laughs> well, how does this work? We're in need of an alternative guardian. So if the, if the one guardian that may guard our hearts is anxiety, what we find is a better guardian in this passage. We find it at the beginning of verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, and then he goes on, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's no other place in the New Testament that this phrase is, is put this way, the peace of God. All, all through the New Testament, Paul and the writers will talk about the God of peace, but here Paul flips it and says, actually, there's this resource, there's this guardian called peace that comes directly from God, and it is the peace of God who is, that is, the best guardian of our hearts. Peace is not the absence of trial. Peace is not the absence of the stress. That's not what we're talking about here. I was talking with a friend just after the first gathering. He came up to me. He said, hey, listen, Sometimes that peace doesn't always remain. It's a battle. It's a wrestling. Sometimes I'm up all night. Yeah, that's true. 
The point is that this is not a message of, hey, flip this switch and you're, you'll be, life will be easy for you. No. What it's saying is there is a resource and a guardian of your heart called peace that in a way, and we're going to look at this in a minute, that we have to activate, that has to be activated in us. But this peace is not the absence of conflict or strife. It's the whole wellness. It's this vision of shalom from the Old Testament. It's a, a wholeness that's connected with the state of salvation. Uh, this is another way we might translate it. It's the sitting down of one's heart. This is what the peace of God does. It's not the running around of one's mind. We might say this way, God causes us to sit down in our hearts. The peace of God causes us to be settled. And if you experience the kind of peace that God can cause for you, then in all you feel and think, there'll be no reason for anxiety. The thoughts will come, no doubt. The stress will come, the, the, you know, the attacks will come. Those things are, are part of what it means to be human in the world. But it's that there will be a different kind of guardian that's protecting you and protecting your heart. When, when it says surpasses all understanding, if you see it here, surpasses all understanding describes the nature of this peace and, and in this language of surpassing all understanding, again, he's pointing back to our condition and saying, look, the peace that you get from God is beyond what you as an individual can think about. It transcends. It's bigger. It's out there. And then he roots it at the end of this passage, I love it, end of verse 7, in the very one who provides the peace, who is Jesus himself. If we're the ones trying to guard our hearts, create anxiety. It's Jesus guarding our hearts that offers us peace. In some of the translations, in some of the language, it's through your union with the life of Jesus Christ. So this is saying, and be very clear on this, this isn't an add-on. This isn't like, oh, you can just kind of go through your life on your own strength and then add on the peace of God. No. What Paul's really saying here is in Christ, when we are in Christ, only when we are in Christ, only when we are in union with Christ, only when we are born into the new life in Christ, the Holy Spirit has filled us and regenerated us, is the peace of God available without Christ. You can have versions of peace, you can have some pseudo peace, you can have moments of stillness and quiet, quietness, but you will not have a resource that transcends. You will not have a peace that lasts. You will not have a peace that surpasses all understanding. It is the life that we have in Christ that offers us the peace of God. So if we have these two potential guardians, anxiety and peace, and we're constantly being ruled often by the anxiety that's rooted in an obsession with our own selves, the question is, how does the guard change? And I'm not a military guy, but I know there's ch the changing of the guard that happens. How does the guard change? How do we go from anxiety to peace? What does that process look like? And this is where we come to this distinguishing act that's right here at the heart and the center of this passage, and it's at the center of the life of the believer. And what does it say here in the second part of verse 6? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything... By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And what happens? The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The act that changes the guard, the act that changes the guardian of your heart from anxiety to peace is a means of grace. It's not a workspace thing. It's the most obvious thing in the world, but it's actually getting on your knees and it's actually acknowledging and confessing that you can't do life on your own. It's impossible. You're going to constantly be in the echo chamber, that you need a resource and someone who's greater than yourself. And it's getting on your knees and it's, it's talking with God himself. It's coming before your Father in heaven who loves you and being transparent about the reality of the things you're struggling with. Isn't that obvious? I mean, isn't that simple? It's really hard to do, isn't it? But that's what this is proposing. The act that, and, and, in, and in the play, what happens in, somehow in, in getting out of ourselves and fixing our eyes on Christ who's seated above, 
speaking with our Father in heaven who is the resource who's better and bigger and greater than us, the anxiety lifts and peace begins to guard our hearts. In everything. This is in contrast to when he says, in nothing, have anxiety. In everything, pray. Let me just say that again. In everything, pray. In everything that you do, pray. The New Testament would say, Paul would say in other places, pray without ceasing. Why? Because it, it guards our hearts. In some translations, we hear, we've maybe heard this spoken of, and, and, and we think that it's just about circumstance and situation. In every circumstance or every situation you're in, and, and that's in there, no doubt. It's partially that. It's part of it is whatever situation you're in, whatever circumstance we should pray. But there is a nuance in the language here that is in all of one's interests. So as the thoughts start rolling through, as you find yourself in the echo chamber of anxiety, that is the point at which those are the things through which you have to bring to your Father in heaven. Prayer and supplication, prayer is a general term. Supplication is usually more about requests. Paul's bringing these things together. He's sort of just saying, holistically, we need to come before our Father in heaven. And of course, this great piece about thanksgiving, it's acknowledging who our Father in heaven is, remembering who he is, thanking him for who he is and what he will do. Here's what Paul is saying to his friends. When you pray, the guard of your heart changes from self-focused anxiety to God's peace and your hearts and minds become safe from attack. It is not to say again that the attacks won't come. It is to say your hearts will be properly guarded by a resource called God's peace. The reason you might ask, well, well, that's great, but, but how does this actually work? Why does prayer, how does this act of prayer actually do this? How does this means of grace actually do this? The reason prayer changes the guard, and this is so important, this is so vital to understanding this passage and the whole story of Scripture, the reason why prayer changes the guard of our hearts, the guarding of our hearts from anxiety to peace, is because the very one we pray to The very one that we pray to is the one who saw us in captivity. And he didn't leave us alone. And he didn't wave his magic wand from on high. But he came in flesh. And he subjected himself to all of the anxieties of the human condition. And he came as a baby. <laughs> he did. He did. It's, it's a... It's a <laughs> It's so true. You think God, I mean, that's what we just celebrated. That's God in flesh. And he came in flesh and he subjected himself to the anxiety. He walked in the echo chamber, as it were. In the garden, if you remember Jesus in Gethsemane, he was praying. Sweat, his sweat was blood. That's, that's severe anxiety, like severe anxiety. But he didn't just stop there. He didn't just come in, hey, let me just walk the human steps for a few years and then I'm just going to whisk away back to heaven. No, he took it further in love. He died in our place, sacrificial love, taking upon our sin, all the effects of sin, all the, all the things that stir anxiety in us. And he set us free. And this is the reason that when we pray to our Father in heaven, when we pray to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, when we pray to Jesus, his peace guards our hearts. His peace guards our hearts. So the question is, I think, as we sort of like close here, what would it look like for our generation? What would it look like for our church? What would it look like for a generation to live our lives on our knees because the worst thing that could happen this morning is that we talk about prayer and we all walk out of here and we're like, great idea, no one prays. <laughs> Are you with me? 
Like we, we, are, we are woefully struggle with so much information in the church without much practice. The spiritual discipline, spiritual practices are how our hearts, means of grace through which the Lord forms and shapes our hearts. So what would it look like for us to live on our knees? What would it look like for us to defiantly say, we're actually as a generation going to reject anxiety, not ignore it, not pretend like it's not there, but we're going to reject the anxiety echo chamber and we're going to change the guardian of our heart to Christ. Do you know what's amazing? Do you know what's amazing what happens after Damar Hamlin goes down. After he goes down, it almost feels like the entire nation went down with him to their knees in prayer. And if you've been following and seeing this, it's pretty astonishing. This is a different photo from the first one that emerged after. Now, can we just go back to the first photo real quick? And now go back to the, 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 the last, the, the other photo. Look at what happens after he goes down. Prayer kind of goes viral, and I'm not here to make a commentary on motives of who prayed and why they pray and what God they're praying to. I'm not making a commentary on that. What I'm saying is something happened on that field that for a lot of people triggered this sense of, wow, maybe we can't just do life on our own. NFL teams... Millions of people posting, prayer, prayer, prayer. Jim Kelly, never won a Super Bowl, right? Sorry, Jim. But he's praying. He's praying with his wife. They held a prayer vigil outside the stadium. An ESPN broadcaster boldly says live, I believe in prayer, and he starts praying over DeMar. And then last night, as DeMar is recovering, one of his first posts on Instagram, do you know what he says at the end? Keep praying for me. This is not just how we're to respond when one of our beloved athletes is struggling. This is actually a picture in this passage, illuminates it for us, is how we're to respond when anything happens, when anyone we love, including ourselves, is struggling. We are to live our lives, brothers and sisters, as people of prayer. People who may not have all the right words to pray. In fact, Jesus had a lot of words to say about people who thought they had the right words to pray. And he was very encouraging the people who didn't have many words to say when they prayed. What if we became a people of prayer, a church that prays, a people who defiantly stand in the face of a culture that says, you can do it yourself. And what we say is, actually, no, we can't. We actually can't do it ourselves, but Christ can, and we will live on our knees, and we will bring everything, every thought, every experience to him in prayer and petition and with thanksgiving. And I don't, sometimes the spirit of God breaks in supernaturally and the circumstance changes and God can do anything. He can do miracles. And sometimes that happens and sometimes he says no and sometimes he says wait and whatever the answer is, that's okay because what he does promise in this passage is his peace, my friends. And his peace is the greatest resource we can have as the guardian of our hearts. Our hearts will be guarded by the peace of God through Jesus Christ. And we will be a kind of people who demonstrate and embody the love of Christ, the peace of Christ to our neighbors and our friends and in our families. And that could be a beautiful thing. Let me just tell you two really cool stories that are unfolding in our city and our area about this. One is actually starting up in a couple weeks, um, and I'm going to put Rebecca on the spot, but the Lord gave Rebecca a vision. She was thinking, I think, about prayer and the word focus for our church. She's going to be starting a prayer night um, on Sunday evenings. Is that right? Um, I think I was allowed to share that. Okay, good. So you can talk, Rebecca's right here. You can talk to her afterwards, and it's a great space to do that. It doesn't have to be in a formalized group, but that's a great place to begin praying together. The other really cool story that's unfolding uh, in in our area, in our county over the last uh, eight months is we've been able to get pastors together to pray um, across our county. We've been doing this for a number of years, but there's sort of been a resurgence here. Every Wednesday morning from 7 to 8 a.m., anywhere from 10 to 15 pastors from across our county, we go mobile and we pray in different parts 
of the county, different parts of different churches, different neighborhoods. And it's beautiful. It's unity. And it's our, it, it, we're saying to Jesus, it's, we are dependent on you. I was texting the group of these pastors. There's over 50 pastors on our little uh, WhatsApp group and, and on the list. And it's just a beautiful thing to see that as shepherds and servants of the church are beginning to pray, our prayer countywide across the body of Christ is that prayer would also be bubbling up, not just here in this church, but in every church. So let me give you a really concrete practice, and then I want to invite the musicians up here as well. Here's the concrete practice, okay? You got to adapt it. You got to figure out what this looks like in your moment, in your context. This week, today, okay, today, anytime you are with some brothers or sisters, your friends, your family, dads, husbands, step up, okay, uh, you're with those around you, roommates, friends, would you just take a moment, okay, just 30 seconds, and get on your knees or bow your heads or do whatever you do and just bring it, bring whatever it is you're up to to the Lord, Thank him for it. Maybe it's a moment to be transparent about something you're feeling anxious about. Hey, I'm feeling a little stressed about this. I just, let's, can we just pray about this real quick? Would you, just, would you just be bold enough and not just reject the live in your head all the time and actually do something about this? Okay? It's not a workspace thing. God's not going to love you more if you do it and less if you don't. This is a means of grace. This is formational for our hearts. Would you, would you, would you guys do that? No, I'm actually asking you right now. Would you, who's willing to do that? Oh, okay, I see that hand. I see that hand. Good. And maybe next week I'm going to ask, how did that go? <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, our hearts are incredibly vulnerable. And when we are the guardian, the anxiety can really rise. So, Lord, we just, we just reject that in Jesus' name. And we say that there is a greater guardian, one who went before us, one who took the source of all anxiety upon himself, and one who in return gives us peace. And I pray for your peace, Lord Jesus, to rest upon this room. Holy Spirit, would you fill us with your peace. I pray for each person in this room that is struggling with anxiety. They would know they are not alone. They would know you were there with them and they would know that there is a people and a community surrounding them this morning that is with them. When the darkest voices come, the peace that you give would cause them to scatter we pray against the enemy's work in our church, in our city, in our world to lie to us, to tell us that we have to manage life on our own, Lord. We want to talk with you. We want to listen to you. We want to be in conversation with you. And we're desperate for you. So shape us and form us to be a people who are in prayer, Lord, in everything. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week as we gather, we, we do gather with our brothers and sisters in this room, and we gather with our brothers and sisters across the planet through a practice of communion. We come to the table together. And again, coming to the table is a defiant act. It's saying we're not individuals. We're a body. We're a people who are here together. Life is not just about me, it's about Christ and it's about what Christ is doing through his people. And we come together to remember the cross and what Christ did for us. The instructions that are passed on to us through the scripture are this, are these in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You can imagine Jesus on that night around that table knowing what he was going to do and probably the anxiety that was creeping up in his heart 
And yet here he was present with his disciples, knowing he was going to go to the cross. And he said, this is my body, broken for you, my brothers and sisters. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Jesus, through his death on the cross, opens up a new living relationship to God. We can be reconciled to God through Christ, through his death, and through the power of his resurrection. And this is his blood poured out for you, my brothers and sisters. The anxiety is going to come. The fear is going to come. You're going to struggle with it. You're going to wrestle with it. There is grace for that. It's not on us. He paid it all. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning and we can come to the right and to the center and then back around again. And the scripture encourages us to examine our hearts as we come. Um, That's not about denomination. If you have professed and proclaimed Christ as Lord, come freely. We come with our hands open to receive uh, as as a picture of what he has done for us. So let's take partake together. As you feel ready, we'll stand and Liz will lead us in this final song.
just want to say that if that is you this morning, you're not alone. You don't have to suffer alone. Reach out. Reach out to the Lord through prayer. Join with others in, around you. Reach out to our team. We're here to serve. There's wonderful counselors in our bodies, wonderful counselors in our area. Um, the Lord does not want you to be alone in the things that you're going through. Um, even though the night may be holding on, God is holding on stronger. He's faithful and he will carry you through just want to close us by praying this beautiful prayer Paul prays over a different church in Ephesus. I just want to model out a little bit of what I'm encouraging us to do this week. I'm going to pray this, um, you know, for us collectively. This is Ephesians chapter four, chapter three, verse fourteen. For this reason, I bow my bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant us to be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.